Hi everyone and welcome to our panel discussion on breaking the glass ceiling and why diversity and leadership is very important, not only in tech organizations, but in every organization. My name is Gazelle. I work in recruiting and I'm also a diversity and inclusion partner at Idealo. And today we have four fabulous guests here, uh, but before I'm gonna introduce them and introduce the topic a little bit more, I want to already invite you uh, to send us your questions in the chat. You'll find a Q&A section um, on the top of your screen. It might also be called F&A, that's fine, it's the same thing, it's just in German. So make sure you write us your questions there. Um, you can either address either of the participants um, or ask all of us, or you can also just share um, your uh, experience with breaking the glass ceiling, for instance, in the chat. So we'll be, it would be great if, we, if this was as interactive as possible. Also, if you have any technical issues, um, you can always write us in the chat. We have a support team there for you as well. Now, without further ado, let's introduce our panelists um, alphabetically, I'd say. Let's start with Dina. Hi, Dina. Um, Dina Kashishian, she is an agile coach for International at Idealo. And you discovered the potential of team development and organizational design when you yourself were part of a leadership team. So you have some managerial experience, a managerial perspective. However, now you're mostly working with other leaders as an agile coach to support them um, in their daily work. And you also say that leadership teams that are not diverse miss out on a lot of potential. Right. So Hi, thank you everyone. for being here. <laughs> Hi. Then we have Fabio. Uh, Fabio, you started at Idealo 2017 as the country manager Italy and now you're chief international officer. Uh, that's quite a change. Um, and you are passionate about creating clear visions for future possibilities based on data and facts. It's always good to have. Um, and inclusion for you also means looking at each person individually and look at everybody's individual strength and potentials. So happy to hear about that. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Then there's Kieran Ganu. Hi, happy Hello. to have you here. Um, you have worked across multiple industries, um, specializing on employer branding, but not only, because currently you're working with our sister company, Aviv, on the fourth floor, actually. You're Correct. not always here, but this is where they're located. Um, as the group director of talent acquisition, employer brand, diversity and inclusion. And that's a lot. And you say that in your, you as a leader, you like to listen. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad we get to listen to you today. Thank, Thank you very much. And then we have Natalie. Hi, Natalie. Natalie Buston. Um, you did a traineeship um, at the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights before then starting as a product owner. That was also quite a change. Um, and then now you're head of product in one of our core functions at Ideal also in product and technology. And um, your leadership style, well, I mean, I work, I work with you, so I would describe it as um, that you appreciate clarity, openness and transparency. Uh, that I can actually say that this is true and I appreciate this about you. So thank you for being here also. Thank you also. Hi. Now, as I was saying today, we're talking about breaking the glass ceiling and the term glass ceiling is something that I kind of want to, you know, define for us here. It is um, when we are metaphorically speaking about some sort of invisible barrier, basically, um, that prevents certain individuals from being promoted in an industry or company. Um, those barriers are most, mostly unwritten. Um, so they're, for instance, implicit biases at the workplace, mm -hmm. or there's bar bar uh, barriers for people that they cannot go further and nobody really understands why, except for perhaps themselves. So they are invisible, but they're there. This is why they're called glass ceilings. And um, Kieran, how does breaking the glass ceiling resonate with you? Or maybe another question, like, can you break it more than once also? Like, is there only one glass ceiling? Is there several glass ceilings? How do you look at it? All right, so I think that when it comes to breaking the glass ceiling, it's understood, right? And it's um, implicitly understood when you're looking at it in the corporate sense, when you're talking about the glass ceiling. You know, it seems like you, you have something in reach, but you can't quite strive um, to touch it. And it's quite unfortunate to see that in your, in your sight. But when we look at organizations, you can see that it's understood, uh, but it's so entrenched in hierarchical point of view that people can see where those biases exist and it stops and prevents them from opportunities to progress in their career, 
despite their qualifications. And some of those biases could include, you know, not being promoted because there are commonalities between the manager and the other person. It could be an interest in a particular sport. That means that they're not actually seen for what they're worth. And then when you look at it in terms of the landscape of today in the labor market, a lot of people recognize this with the powers of sites like LinkedIn, they can actually see an online CV and how people progress. And if I gave myself as an example, if you peruse my LinkedIn profile, you can see that I've moved strategically throughout my career in different industries. And that's because I do come from a marginalized community. Um, and I'm also very mindful that the only way that I can actually progress in my career is actually seeking opportunities elsewhere. And a lot more people are aware of that too, to be able to stand the opportunity to be seen, heard and visible in the marketplace. Yeah. So you can, you know, in theory, when you look at how often people move and change their career, break the glass ceiling several times. That's interesting and that also you also pointed out already um, that this and this is also something that I tried to include in the definition that it's sometimes or often marginalized people from marginalized communities, perhaps, mm -hmm. um, or for non dominant communities um, who are actually seeing that glass ceiling or facing this glass ceiling. Would you say that this is like a, a leadership thing or like a train you need to train your leaders and your leadership teams on this or is this something for the diversity and inclusion department does it have anything to do with diversity and inclusion even it absolutely does you know um for example i've got quite a sizable team at aviv and uh i'm also autistic and it's very rare for somebody with autism to have the opportunity to lead or to be trusted to lead a team and what I consciously do is I lead with compassion and empathy and I listen to my team. But I also explain sort of some of the barriers I find and how I learn, how I adapt and how I digest information. Because I know that they are going to be leaders one day. And I'd like to equip them with the skills of leading compassionately and in an unbiased way so that other people that work under them in the future have opportunities like this. That's perfect. And also, I believe thinking of like your own team and what you can do. This is something that Absolutely. I would want to um, talk about later in the discussion. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I remember, Dina, when we were speaking um, prior to this panel discussion and I was mentioning the glass ceiling, you were also like, yeah, I have a perspective on this as well when it comes to working with teams. What was your idea when you were uh, when you were hearing the term glass ceiling? Right. <clears throat> so. First of all, the term resonates with me because it's usually or mostly associated with women at work. Um, that's, the, mo that's what mostly happens when you hear the term glass ceiling. And it happened to me as well um, in, in companies before. Um, I have once worked in a male only management team and I was the only person who, along with my highly appreciated work and all my tasks, um, was given the rest of the additional operational tasks on top. So like I was never really having a seat at the table. I was always being kept busier, you know? And so I was, I was hitting the glass ceiling. And the example, Kieran, you, you kind of mentioned it before uh, when it comes to women is, is the classic example, an, a knowledgeable, highly skilled woman is not being promoted because for example, in her company, um, men, are viewed, are being viewed as more suitable leaders, right? And um, this is where it resonates with me and, and has in the past as well. But still, like you also said before, the term um, is also being associated with minority groups, but it's, it's, it goes really beyond gender and ethnic topics. Um, another example would be the very highly experienced software developer, male, who is um, at the age of 52 not being viewed as someone that would fit in a startup, for example, because there the people think that the workforce, mostly millennials, right, he wouldn't fit. And that's another way where he is hitting the glass ceiling because of these hidden traditions, old traditions, biases, beliefs, just how we believe the perfect candidate looks like. Um, now, when it comes to my work with teams, there's there's lots I can do. So I, as an agile coach, I'm a lateral leader and part of my job would be to facilitate workshops. And there I have a big lever, the way I facilitate the workshops, because not only that I do it with leaders in my company currently, but also 
by doing the workshops with them, they learn about the methods that I do. So for example, after workshop, they come, they want to copy it, right? I help them out with templates, etc. So it's really, I'm spreading knowledge with methods and ways how to offer a safe space in my workshops. And there I have a big lever for diversity and inclusion. I don't know if we will touch this topic later, mm -hmm. most probably, but there is ways um, how I, as a facilitator, can give an, a safe space to a diverse team, right? Absolutely. I mean, you basically mentioned two topics um, that I heard that we will certainly um, be talking about later on. One is um, the matter of tools, if you mm -hmm. will, but also a matter of um, representation or who you see in your company. Mm -hmm. And do you see somebody that you could look up to that, you know, it's like, helping you to grow and supporting you to grow. Um, and before we move into that and dive deeper into that, I have the first poll for everybody watching coming in. Um, and this is the question of, have you hit the glass ceiling yourselves before? Um, so I'll give you a moment before the poll is coming up, uh, then please uh, answer whether it is yes, you personally felt the glass ceiling before, yes, you saw somebody in your surrounding, or no, you never hit the glass ceiling so far. We're very curious to see what the audience says. And until then, Natalie, maybe about you personally, how was your becoming a leader experience? Did you like, after you did that traineeship, you knew you wanted to be a leader? No, not at all. Um, <clears throat> in my previous job, I was a product owner at another company and I never really felt like I would be a manager in my life. I never had the ambitions, but I also got the feedback kind of a little bit, like you said, like in a male environment, I never mm. saw myself there in this position, although maybe I was always, always interested in it. And so uh, when I came to Idealo, I was kind of interested in the theory of, of leading and leadership. And I did some seminars and, and also saw different people in these positions, which made me also consider it. And I think that's when I tried to do it. I just um, yeah applied for the job and I got the trust also where I felt safe um, to, to experience also this for myself. So that was my path, which was not planned by me in the <laughs> beginning of my career. Yeah, but also the matter of trust here also, yes. right? As a core value, that's yeah. something you have. You need to have somebody who sees it in you and who gives you the trust, uh, maybe who supports you breaking the ceiling, if you will. Exactly. This brings us to the answers. Perfect timing. Um, uh, most people have hit the glass ceiling or have seen somebody hitting the glass ceiling. Um, I mean, that's almost 90%. That's a lot. Um, so we have touched based on a certain of, on certain topics. We've talked about very briefly about tools and about representation. And before we come to that, um, I want to touch base also something that you addressed also, but that we also addressed in the beginning, that diversity in itself and inclusion in itself is super important, of course, for every healthy workplace. And I remember, that, like in my work experience, so when I started like 10 years ago, um, in 2018, there was this McKinsey study, probably most of us have read it, probably most of the audience have heard about it. It's one of the most successful studies from back then, when it was all about, yes, diversity and inclusion are important. The more diverse and inclusive you are, the higher the productivity of your company, the more innovative you are, and um, also 90% higher retention, so people will stay if your workforce, if the surrounding is diverse and inclusive. And after that, of course, there's, there have been many studies that show us this. And that brings me to you, Fabio, because um, Chief International Officer, this means uh, operating five international websites. That means five nationalities at least represented here in Berlin, all sitting at one place or in one digital room. Um, and I was wondering, how do you feel about the correlation of productivity and diversity? How do you experience your work environment currently? Um, yes, I'm normally not the manager that look to the diversity report every week, but I, I did it for um, the panel. And, um, and it's in international, we are around 160 uh, person coming from 29 different country. So more, more than five, as you uh, guess. And um, we have 62% are women, our employer, our leader are 50-50. And we have also a wide range of uh, age from 21 until uh, 65, which that means different seniority, different experience. Um, but that is only showing that I have a department with diversity. Means that 
I have a diverse department. Not really. It's probably like this because, as you say, diversity brings us more diversity. And um, now coming to to your question, uh, what is important for use this diversity? And one metric that I also looking for for understand if uh, the department or the team or a company is um, diverse and have this diverse mentality is the level of innovation or the level of improvement that there is in a specific um, department where for innovation i don't mean like create a new product every day or a new feature innovation can also be change a process or um, at least um, challenging the status quo and obviously you need to create an environment that is inclusive where all these differences this different perspective this different uh, point of view can be used if you want to uh, to use this word uh, because that will bring um, discussion probably also conflict but also bring uh, ahead your company and so make you also uh, successful and increase also then the productivity and for example Dina was mentioning um, give this format give, give tools and have person like Dina that are focusing on that create this inclusive uh, environment that then you can use all the diversity that you have so um, for answering it's not enough just to hire diverse if then you don't have an environment where you can use the diversity mm -hmm. I would, I would like to jump on that because um, you use the term environment and that's actually quite interesting because when you say at a company we want to go for more diversity it doesn't really mean much other than okay we're inviting more minorities to our to work at our company to work with us but then what happens once they arrive right that that's when it actually starts how would you treat them what would you have to offer offer for for them do you have an environment do you have safe spaces where they can actually be themselves and that's exactly what what fabi just elaborated and i think this is where the term diversity is also in politics or linkedin or social media it's 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 a buzzword still because you can understand so much with this term at the same time it doesn't mean much right it really comes with the action that's behind it and as well as um how is the company really engaging in f offering more to their employees but all, instead of only inviting minorities to join them mm. And, and people see that, right? So in yeah. most organizations, you've got instant messaging systems, right? And, you know, you have companies that sort of shout about diversity, inclusion, we mm -hmm. want to do more, we're going to create a strategy. But then, you know, silence can often be deafening when people can see if they're not interacting, if the senior leaders are not interacting with those individuals, if they're not putting them on a platform, right. celebrating them, making them more visible, you know, allowing them to be heard. It's I mean, it's, it doesn't go unnoticed amongst those individuals, and they're usually the first to leave. Right. Absolutely. And that actually, maybe we can like get a little bit more details on, detail on two things, perhaps, because I, um, I mean, the two of you work in international, Ideal International. Maybe I point this out to the audience also, because of course we all know. But you know, to make this clear, it's the same environment. Um, Dina, you were mentioning tools. Um, can you maybe just, I mean, you all were already mentioning them, but can you elaborate on like one or two examples? Like, let's say we have somebody in the audience, because when I talk to people about diversity, sometimes I can see that they don't want the discussions. They don't like the challenge. They see they have this one other person and all of a sudden everything becomes complicated. Um, what tools would you have at hand to facilitate discussions or facilitate a meeting or to facilitate uh, a diverse team, if that makes sense. Right. I mean, I can give very practical tips because, like, for example, if I facilitate a workshop, and like I said before, I always have to try to create a safe space, right, for the participants, let's say a, a leadership team, then as a facilitator or when, when I write the concept for the workshop, I have different options of, of methods that I bring in. First of all, we work with this one famous online whiteboard tool collaboration tool Miro and then when we when we all come to the board and we open the session 
I, as a facilitator, when, when I uh, uh, prepare, I can, for example, start with check-ins and check-outs. How do I do them? Do I do them in, for example, do I ask a question where everybody would have to elaborate for a minute before you can pass on the mic, or do I do it in writing? Same when it comes, you know, for, for example, if people feel uncomfortable to immediately start speaking up or, you know, sharing points. Uh, second, secondly, when it comes to group work, what I could do is offer methods where groups would mix, you know, mm. for example, I can prevent um, the leadership team or the team that I work with um, from going into their peer groups already like they would always do, but instead I can use methods to mix it up, you know, and this is what um, the leadership um, um, in, in my company also does and like um, uh, is, is asking me to support them with is these kind of like tricks and, and methods to not like spice up a workshop, you know, like to really create safe spaces and to, to mix it up. Yeah. That's quite interesting that you mentioned that because I think with a lot of organizations where they are international, um, when we talk about a glass ceiling, there's so many, you've got a gender glass ceiling or a racial glass ceiling, right. cultural glass ceiling. Um, and sometimes in those environments, especially when organizations haven't done the work yet about cultural awareness, mm -hmm. when you're in those situations and you have communities of people that don't speak, their silence should never be taken as, as acceptance. It could just be a cultural mark of respect. I think that's also another important thing for organizations to understand. Yeah, also there's a difference between um, saying we accept everyone or saying we take a clear stand being in solidarity with certain groups or whatever or actively including certain groups and naming them and this is something that also i believe in um, germany not everybody is aware that we kind of now talk about women and men and gender but we are very like cautious when it comes for instance to ethnicity or whatever like quotas of black and brown people or whatever like you would look at it in the us like it was something very common. Mm. You wouldn't yet normally do this in Germany, for instance. Um, but we were also talking about safe spaces and, um, and Natalie and Fabio, if I may say so, and myself, we are part of the LGBTQ plus community. <laughs> and this is all about, you know, creating safe spaces, right? Um, so how can we have a workplace in which we can say this openly? I mean, us being in the panel and just be like, yeah, that's just facts. That has not been something common or usual back in the days. So maybe Natalie, what will you say, like, let's say I have, like, we have people watching and they're leaders and somebody in the team is part of the LGBTQ plus community um, and they're like, what do I do with them? What would you say? I would say, listen to them in the first place. So I, I don't think you need to, um, yeah, talk with LGBT people differently than others, but just be open to everybody and also for them to, to raise their voices and, and talk about their maybe private life if it's um, appropriate in the in the one on one. Um, so for me, it's, as I said before, um, having a safe environment, which I always felt like at Idealo, uh, was also some, some thing for me to step out, uh, to be openly gay, uh, for example, because it's part of me and I don't want to hide it. But when I decided to apply for the position, I knew, of course, it would put more light on me, um, or yeah, to, to be more more in the um, in the yeah, shed, shed the light on me. So uh, it was something I thought of um, if I wanted it. But yes, I did felt I did feel safe here, so that's why I do did it. So yeah, I would I would say just listen to the people um, and and. Maybe turning it around, like what what would make you feel safe? Can you like pin it down in any way, or was it? I think that's what we discussed before. Um, to to not only think that uh, diversity is something which is cool or in, but to live it. And I feel like Idealo is living it in in the part where I uh, have 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 um, experience. And so that's where what I experience all the time when I talk to people: the very openness of of everyone. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Would you like to add anything? Didn't wanna. Um, I was thinking about um, my experience when I started at Idealo. I have to be, be honest, at the beginning I was not um, mentioning at all my uh, sexual orientation because you never know. Uh, you don't know how your boss is thinking or how the company uh, was thinking. So it takes for me a time to uh, come in out and, <laughs> and start to speak about uh, openly about that. At the beginning I was also played so the hetero and so just for be sure. 
Um, but now, for example, if I look to Idealo now, when you are coming to our office, the first that you see is the sticker that sale is a LGBT plus um, zone. And it's something very easy, but if I will have that the sticker six years ago it will be completely different for me. And, um, and uh, what I have also to say, thanks for example to Gazelle or also for our employer branding of Idealo that um, show me that I can be this sticker now and exactly do a panel like this or take part of that is also an uh, invitation to say, okay, feel comfortable, look at me, I'm here and um, I'm, I manage a big department of Idealo, so it's possible. And the amazing so thing about it is that it's a sense of belonging. So nice. And then you become a role model for yourself. You know, that shows like other people who are part of the community that oh, we can be the chief international officer here. <laughs> and there is no glass ceiling for us. That's good. Like we can put this, like click this off the map. Uh, tick this box. Sorry. Speak slower, Gazelle. Okay, then um, maybe we have some questions from the audience. We might want to tackle those and also, in, no, actually we do a poll first. Let's do a poll first and then we answer them. Because I want to know from the audience now, do you feel that you can be your true selves at work? I'd be curious about that. We give you a moment. We'll be answering. Uh, we will, yeah, we will answer your question from you first, and then look at the results. Because I have something here, Kieran, that might be for you, because you're, you know, employer branding expert, recruiting expert. Um, uh, there's a person from a recruiting person, I believe, and they ask, "What would be your key advice for recruiters to help candidates to break the glass ceiling?" You know, even candidates, but also I find it with my hiring managers as well, is that people often forget who they are and how they've got to where they are and their skills, and they're actually really good. And sometimes people need that boost of confidence, that reminding of what they've achieved, which is why that conversation is happening between that candidate and a recruiter. And I think it's, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm from the UK, I love a compliment. Um, so I think that's also very important. Uh, from an employer brand point of view, when we're generating content and I'm speaking to leaders, I'm reminding them of why it's so important to share their story. Because a lot of people spend a lot of time looking at their profiles and thinking, how did they get to that point in their career? But then when you're speaking to that candidate, remind them as well why that conversation is taking place. That sounds like encouraging them, absolutely. The poll results, perfect. Um, uh, do you feel safe at, oh, 60% of people say that they feel safe at the workplace. Mm. Some not always. That's actually, I find that a lot of people actually, 40%. That's not, that's not not much actually. Um, how do we, so another question from the audience is also, why is it difficult sometimes for leaders to talk about these matters? You know, it could also be maybe they do not feel um, themselves or do not feel like they can be their true selves at work because they, nobody is addressing it proactively perhaps or not being a role model, you know, in any direction. Um, how can we work on that? Like, why would you, do you think it's sometimes difficult for leaders to talk about it? I think it depends on who you are. So I'm um, obviously brown, I'm African and um, child of immigrants. And I was conditioned growing up to keep your head down, don't cause any drama, you know, you have to retain your job because there's always that fear that you could potentially lose your employment. Um, so I can understand completely why some people have that fear um, of being able to be truly authentically themselves. And when you look at, you know, we talk about glass ceiling, we talk about, you know, for example, women, there is another layer of that. And that's, you know, the marginalization and how tough it is for women of color to progress. And there is a, a, a term called the concrete ceiling. It was a term coined by Jasmine Barber in 2016. And it basically, you know, when you look at a glass ceiling, you can see what's in reach. But for a lot of women of color, you can't see past the concrete ceiling. And I think that's really important too, to factor. The feeling that um, diverse people as, as or I can speak for myself, it's always like a fight against a bat. He is Italian, but he is professional. She mm. has children, but she is uh, a good worker. And always this bad. And then um, I think that all of us 
experience that you have to work two times more for each the same at the normal or the colleague beside you. And this is something that also when you arrive to a company like, for example, Ideal, this is very open and something that you have in yourself because you are experienced so long. And this is also difficult for the person uh, to speak about and also for um, the leader that maybe didn't have this experience really to understand what does it mean because it's much more deeper than just, okay, you are Italian, it's something or, or you are homosexual. It's very a long process. That uh, is also not always that the person is, uh, himself or herself already did all this process. It's, it's good that you mention uh, mentioning Italy now because um, do you happen to know if the conversation about diversity is different in Italy, for instance? Because people in the chat ask. There is no conversation in Italy. There's no conversation at all. <laughs> um, uh, no, it's, um, I mean, uh, women and men is obviously also a, a topic, but it's finished also there on that, uh, on that level. Um, depend also in which part of Italy you are, in which sector you are, there are sectors are much more open and if you think about the fashion and Italy obviously there, you don't have this type of um, problem in diversity and inclusion. Overall I would say that um, Italy is um, has more a more classic way of do business uh, compared for example Germany or the um, English um, business and mark. Um, so yes, it's the <laughs> different um, discussion. But I think also in different companies, when it's not in the tech market, um, there are lots of different ways of dealing um, with diversity. So I think whenever I say how it is here and how I experience it here, um, I get the feedback that it's not at all in, in different other countries, uh, companies. Um, so do you think it's know. like any any industry or just I think it doesn't matter? It doesn't matter. I think we we have a bubble here. Um, so it's always good to, to think of others as well. I mean, I remember, Dina, I don't know if you remember this now, um, but when we were having a conversation, you were telling me, because you had some changes in your career, it's not like they didn't make sense or anything, but it's just like when you look at it on LinkedIn, you're like, okay, then she was this and then she was that. And then I was wondering, who did you look up to? And then you were also, part of it was also literally looking up your role models somewhere. I don't know if you want to maybe tell us about that. Who did you, who were your role models, perhaps? Like, who did you look up to? Right, I'm not sure what I told you, <laughs> but I definitely always looked up to um, women in unseatable positions because this is basically where I feel like, okay, wow, um, there is women who, who get promoted. It's happening, it's possible because I myself didn't experience that always in my career. For example, in, in, in earlier companies where I worked in, where I told you I, I didn't really get the seat at the table, even though my work was appreciated, right? Or just what Fabio said, like you have to work twice as hard to get the same appreciation for it, etc. So what I always looked at was um, women in, in, in leadership positions, definitely for sure, just on social media, LinkedIn, for example. Um, but at the same time, I think, like like we said before, it's not only about gender, right? It goes beyond gender, um, the the term of of breaking the the term of glass ceiling. Um, and I think the the problem is still that we sometimes lack of education. I mean, we in our environment, we we could say we are in this gray bubble where we have a lot of education, we do panels like this, we talk about it, we exchange, right? We learn from each other, etc. But then it's diversity is really, it's a broad term. For example, if I, myself, um, if, if the EJA coaches at International were all Armenian, Iranian, let's say five of them, this wouldn't be a diverse team, right? I mean, that that's, that's, that's not it. It's about creating spaces for different perspectives, right? Bringing different perspectives to the table, also creating safe spaces to let them speak up in their way, in their own way. But um, that's, that's not already it. So there's a lot going on with diversity and role models, but it definitely helps for yourself if you search for someone that you see where you're like, okay, I, I consider, like I can see myself going up there or going this way or following, following this path. For a long time, we didn't see black women on social media as much compared to today or, or C-level 
uh, people that were openly say that would openly say I, I'm I'm gay. I'm part of this and that community, right? Speaking about sexual orientation was never really a part of it, etc. So, I think looking up the industry that you work in or comparing companies and who do you see, who do you find, do you see anyone um, that could be a role model for yourself? I think that's a great power already. Absolutely. We have another question that is also um, evolving around how to get started. Like, let's say there is nothing there. Um, what could be the first baby step to, to like implement a safe space? I don't know. I mean, Natalie, for instance, maybe like just a different nuance and then everybody feel invited to, you know, to have a think while Natalie mm -hmm. replies and maybe find her answer to this because that'd be interesting. A different aspect of your work is also that you have different seniorities, for instance, the people that you lead, I know that. Um, how do you go on about it? Do you have a trick, any advice? I think it's the same going back to what I said before. Um, you need to find out where the people are standing right now and what they need in the next step. So I think um, it comes back to listening and, and understanding where the next step for the, for the person is. So basically listening, but also analyzing like it's, what they bring, understanding yes. their strengths and the challenges basically. Exactly, and of course what they are doing. It also depends on what team they are in and what the challenge are. challenges are. Very much also a coaching aspect, right? Yes, sometimes it's coaching. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Any other ideas for baby steps into creating safe spaces? Stickers? Yeah, I would probably say anonymous surveys in terms of a social listening exercise and giving people the confidence that they are actually anonymous <laughs> um, is super important because you're giving people that space to be heard. Um, the other element is looking at reviews that are left for your company, right? Especially on um, so many sites, like even Glassdoor and Indeed, uh, you know, data gets fed into Bloomberg, it affects the share price of the company. It has a lot of weighting. It really defines whether people want to do business with you. Um, so I think that's also a great place to get an idea of how people have felt when they've left your organization. So you can look at your current and your former employees I would definitely say it's it's a big part that the um, that the C level of the company or the founders, whoever are behind that topic, right? They have to want it. They have to want um, diverse leadership teams or diversity in their company. But at the same time, when it comes to all of us being part of it, like I myself just come from a recruiting process where I was recruiting my tandem. And I, I told myself over and over again, also when I spoke to Fabio, stop hiring people that are just like us. That's also what I what I told you when, when we met. And uh, it, it wasn't easy because once when, whenever I see someone that is just like me, I click so easily, I connect, right? It's the same background. We talk about whatever Armenian Iranian stuff, what's going on in Iran, I don't know, you know? Or if it's a female, uh, same age, uh, whatever, um, I, I click easily and I feel like, okay, you know what, I think there's a vibe. Let's hire this person. So you have to actively say no or stop yourself holding, holding yourself back from hiring the same people over and over again, right? And this is how you create different levels of sonorities instead of this is how you create diverse teams. Um, by repeating it over and over again, I guess. And this is where we all support each other by talking about it, right? And, and creating awareness, education, what is there in terms of glass ceilings or diversity levels? It's not only gender, there's also age, there's different topics and, and, and issues where we can, where we have a lever to work on. Um, I would like to jump in because you are saying um, I, either they are not like us, so the first step, I would say that a company should be conscious who he is huh? with person, the, the status quo, because then you can work on that. And, and sometimes it's also that missing. And so you cannot change something if you don't know what, what is the reality. Um, for example, there is also tools that help like um, the Gallup test just for understand, okay, how is the strain of my team, what I'm missing, which personality also I'm missing. There is also very good uh, personality tools that you can do with the with your team. And then you see, okay, they are all introverts. Yeah, probably I need a push, uh, and maybe I try to to find 
uh, with someone that have, obviously they are skilled, but then um, have also this extrovert part so that push maybe the team or bring other perspective or in other way around. Um, so there is a tool that can use for understand before what you have and then uh, go for the next step. And that if I think to baby step, the first one, okay, analyze yourself and analyze your company. And that's perfect because we have a very interesting question from the audience here, which is also when you look at yourselves, um, there is this thing, uh, I think it's called walk of privilege, I'm not sure, but it's about, you know, you have a group of people and then you like discuss privileges, for instance, if you um, are, no, if you are not white, you step one step forward. If you are a woman, you step another step forward. And the further you go, or the more you are left behind, the higher is a privilege because you didn't have to move, right? And that you can have a hierarchy if you will. And one question here says, I am a cisgender white woman. I want to increase my um, opportunities, but how do I do this without depriving marginalized groups of their opportunities? So how do I create the self-awareness? Like, how is this possible? You know, I feel like there is people who need this opportunity more. This could be the question. Yeah, but they, you know, if I was speaking for myself, we don't want to be pitied, right? Um, we also want to be recognized. So for me personally, I would look at, you know, if I was in that situation, I saw somebody was, you know, sort of vying for an opportunity to be promoted or to be seen. Um, I would like to see that there'd be equal opportunity. I do not believe that I deserve to be ahead of them just because of the color of my skin or I'm autistic, you know? Um, and I think that's really important. It's, you know, fairness, equality. There's a reason it's there. Equity also, right? And equity, absolutely. Mm. But there's opportunities to celebrate those people as well. You know, if you can see that they're vying for a similar opportunity, but you were selected, you could also look at why you were selected whilst taking them on that journey too. And I remember I was only recently invited as a speaker, um, and I love talking about my transness. You know, this is a topic, you know, trans at work, whatever. I love to talk about it. I love to talk about myself anyways. But I was invited to talk about my profession as a Gen Z expert. And that was like, and I happened to be trans. I mean, maybe there was also some special effect happening for them, like good for them, because of course I looked fabulous, but of course I appreciated that they were inviting me for my professional skills at the end of the day, showing equity and equality by checking not only, I don't know, cisgender speakers, but also have a trans person as a speaker there as well. This is also like the twist of it. So representation definitely matters. Exactly. And now very interesting. Now, I don't know who of you has children, but is this a topic at schools? The two of you, right? Is this a topic at schools? Not at school yet. <laughs> so, <shut laughs> and before, like kindergarten? Yeah, kindergarten, sure, yeah. No. No. So for the kids, no. Do you feel any, like, do you sometimes have moments um, with your child where like, oh, this is interesting, this is like a wake-up call, that they bring something home or say something or whatever? It's all chill. It's, it's probably a little later. I'll get too early. What about you, though? So they teach it in my son's school. Um, there's a lot of uh, single-sex parents at my son's school as well, so they taught it quite young. Um, but they also teach mindfulness, and I think that's very, very important. Um, and it's quite interesting because he often reprimands people from a sort of dated sort of viewpoint, different, de you know, sort of age demographic, uh, where, you know, even when I grew up, I used to have my parents, you know, to tease me, is that your boyfriend, you know? And my son actually makes comments, says, I don't know. I might like a girl, I might like a boy. I might like somebody non-binary. I don't know. I haven't decided yet. I don't know who I am yet. <laughs> uh, and I think that's really nice uh, to see that for the generation coming, you know, Gen Alpha. It could also be quite humbling. I get reminded, you know, when you said that you were Gen Z, my son said to me last week, you know, what was it like being born in the 1900s? <laughs> No? Very nice. <laughs> Very good. Nice. <laughs> I mean, he's a star. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, any other experience from schools or from children? I mean, I guess where are you going with this question? Um, it's, it's again awareness, right? So for example, sometimes you don't get to choose the environment of your kid, even though it, it may seem so easy, but you just, there's a school nearby, this is where you go, so you put them there. And then the school or the class even, right? The, the 30 people in the, in the kids class happen to be all from one 
ethnic background. Okay, so what do you do then, right? I think, again, it's about education and awareness and finding yourself role models. This is why it is so amazing that we now have all these women in politics stepping up their game. You know, we have a female, ch we, we've had a female chancellor in Germany, or, you know, um, Obama's wife is quite famous still, and she still uh, is trying to be a role model for all these, these women out there, or Scandinavia. You know, there's all these examples now, which is overly exciting. And I think that's what it's it's about try to, you know, same with the company, um, company or at home, try to educate, um, raising awareness um, and, and see what it's possible and, and understand what it's about. It's not only about female or male, there's so much more to it, seriously, you know? Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's where you have um, a big lever again. I think what's also quite cool is the teach from a very early age gender pronouns mm -hmm. so my son never makes any assumptions he always starts with they them mm -hmm. until somebody feels comfortable to share how they identify i think that's quite beautiful that's really cool yeah i don't think we have this in Germany. <laughs> i mean pronouns are still with adults is still a challenge i believe sometimes but now when we talked about uh, the international department it sounds a little bit like you know almost like a perfect state, right? Like gender balance, almost perfect. Well, the closest to perfect that you that any manager could, could imagine going. Um, and then so many different nationalities. And then, of course, we know you cannot represent every minority or every marginalized group. Um, but do you have like any advice on how you look in, at the recruiting process to like avoid this? We had an idea from Dina saying, you know, just try to not hire yourself. Um, how do we do it? Like, why is there so many different people? Do you have any, have you ever analyzed this? Well, um, a part is always uh, coming organically. As you say, we have in five countries, then for example, for Spain, UK, automatically you have more nationality because we are more focused on the languages, not of, okay, it's Spanish from Spain or UK from England. It's, uh, it's not automatically. So there is a part that's coming automatically and that is already, and especially when they are leader, they already have another mindset to say, okay, it's, now I have in my team someone coming from Argentina, Spain, Colombia, all the different countries. It's already diversity for start. And that is already a base where you can work on. Um, what we really um, did with uh, almost all of our um, department is really this uh, Gallup test and the Clifton uh, test so that um, there is this awareness of how is my team and uh, where I have uh, uh, strengths and where is, if there is something is missing. Um, and then we always say, uh, be focused of what do, what do you need uh, in this role? Why, first of all, you want to have this role? And second, what do you really need? And then if you are focused about this, I want to answer my need automatically you are not looking to, okay, is man, is a woman, is coming from Italy or is coming from another country, um, because you are just thinking to the best of the company. And so you don't have this bias, uh, or I mean, I hope you don't have this bias. And so I, it's really develop themselves automatically. It's not that we say, okay, now you stop to hire men and you have to hire only woman or now stop to hire German, we just take um, um, people from other country. I feel like this is also it's in some way the conversation people think we're having when we talk about diversity, right? If we talk about gender balance and some people think, okay, now we're only hiring women, right? Mm -hmm. Like, of course, this is not what we do. Uh, but maybe looking at recruiting, do you have any more insights for us, perhaps? Like, well, how do you do there's it? There's a, a report that by 2024, 47.2% of the workforce will be women. But there's still a lot to do to create that parity um, for, for that equality. And I think we're still a long way off because there are so many layers, like I said, with um, we look at racial and cultural and, and gender uh, glass ceilings, concrete ceilings, even. Um, and I think it's the lack of cultural awareness, it's the lack of training and understanding, even the difference between diversity or difference in inclusion, or what is actual equity to actually drive any change. Mm -hmm. And it needs to be shouted out from the top. And when you have, you know, exec d &I sponsors, they should fully understand what they're talking about too, to give people the confidence 
to drive that change. Absolutely. Do you feel that this is also something that you see as your obligation to like be out, to like be a good role model, or is this something that comes also? And also, how do you make sure that you are living the inclusiveness also that you want to represent, perhaps? Like you as a manager yourself, not maybe C-level sponsor, but still every leader might have this obligation. How do you look at that? In terms of recruiting? In recruiting or leading in general, you know, leadership in general. I think it just comes naturally for me, uh, at least. And I think um, as we work in tandems, for me, this is very uh, a nice way to learn also other perspectives, perspectives of leadership. Um, and so I can give something to my tandem partner and he can also teach me new stuff. Um, but yeah. What's the newest thing that you've learned? Oh, like the, the, the last time, the best thing that you've learned for your leadership? Uh, definitely coaching, because I also, this is something where I need to learn more uh, in terms of coaching, because I always tend to, to finish things and to, to go for the solution. So that's something what I learned from my partner uh, to, to yeah, go more into the coaching aspect of leadership. I want to jump on perspectives, like Natalie said, because I think we also talked about that, Gazelle, when we met before. It's really about the perspectives, because the joke, when, it, when, when we keep saying um, there was this room, uh, white men only, right? Um, I think the, the, the joke is here that it's one perspective. So what we can do also in leadership is try to always get more perspectives or the most or, you know, um, that's the joke. And that's when I said, imagine we would have an agile coach team um, only Armenian Iranians, then the same again, one perspective. So this is what we want to do, right? To remind ourselves and then also establish tools and processes where it allows us automatically to include more perspectives. This is already diversity, right? To try to include that over and over again, whenever you do that in problem solving, solution finding, um, at whichever stage of your process, um, try to bring more perspectives to your table. And um, like Natalie said, I think that's that's a great thing that she can already do. And I think by that, by, you know, people are watching Natalie, including or bringing more perspectives into the discussion or, or to the table, whatever, it, she's again being a role model or already, you know, that's already one step. She doesn't have to talk about her sexual orientation all the time, but, mm -hmm. you know, also in the collaboration with other agile coaches, the way we conceptualize our workshops, the way we create safe spaces, it's basically about perspectives and also thinking about, okay, how, how can we get them, you know, to, to speak up? What are the ways that people feel comfortable speaking up? Like we talked about, um, maybe not in writing, not all the time. There's all these uh, these options, but I think this is already being a role model when you try to establish that in your daily work or in your company. Mm. I think it's important to do that, but there's another element to it as well when it comes to how I see recruiting, is that you must have diverse teams and not hire the same because they need to represent your consumer base. Mm. Exactly. You know? If, you, if they don't represent your consumer base, you're not going to be commercially successful, end of, right? And I think that's super important. And then when you look at those consumers, would they want to invest in your company? We see lots of you know, companies in retail environments where they are acute, not acutely aware at all of their consumer base and they make judgment calls or hire the wrong people. Mm -hmm. And as a result, it's affected their profit margins. Mm -hmm. There is, of course, a, like a profit benefit with diversity and inclusion. Absolutely. If you, if you want only like one part of the population to buy your products, then only have that population on board. But if you want everybody to have your product, then you need to have those people represented in your company as well, thinking about the product, of course. 100%. There's two more aspects that we have. Um, we might go a little bit over time, just mentioning this here. Please stay with us. However, I promise we won't go much longer than five or 10 minutes later before you can have dinner, everyone. Um, but there's two things that I want to address here um, that might be interesting because some of the questions evolve again around the topic of how to get conversations started in the sense that C-level sponsoring, we were talking about it. And then all of us were like quite aware. And we were also mentioning buzzwords that might not be familiar to everyone even the term marginalized communities what does this even mean representation what does this even mean where do we start 
Natalie, I know you have like a bachelor's, I think, in uh, intercultural communication or master's even. I don't know. Is this like, would you recommend this to everyone and then you're good? Or any other recommendation? <laughs> Study intercultural communication. Um, I would say it's, it's all coming back to taking different perspectives, as Dina said before, and, mm -hmm. and listening. So I sit down, sit down and, and listen and understand what the people, what, what is driving the people um, in terms of what they want to share also. I mean, it's, it's always about the, um, the, the relationship between you and the person you're talking to. You cannot just say, hey, what's your sexual orientation? Come on, tell me now. Um, you need to trust, to get the trust from the person you're working with. And if that's nothing they want to share, it's totally fine as well, of course. Um, but I think it, it's a process of getting to know each other and to, to raise the trust um, of the leadership um, person also from the, from the person you're working with. I remember in the last panel discussion, people were very interested in like books, for instance, book rec recommendations. So let's say we want to get started either for our company as a whole with diversity or understanding perspectives, maybe individual perspectives, starting with one at a time. Any recommendations, any books that you read recently that could support this? I think for an easy start, there's definitely um, good TED Talks or TEDx Talks from all different countries in all different languages on YouTube available for free. And they're short, comprised, and they offer you a lot of different perspectives on the topic of diversity and leadership and diverse leadership. So I think that's already a good point to start. Um, um, and, and it's, I think it's always easier when you start with something, not a, not a big book or a long podcast, but instead like create yourself more small touch points with the topic, you know, like don't be afraid, don't be scared, you know, in case you don't know where to start, just start grasping here and there, reading an article, you know, I would say start easy, start slow and maybe choose yourself one dimension first like we said before it's not it's not only gender and, and ethnicity but it goes beyond that but okay whatever choose choose your your topic first and dive dive into that a little bit more for example if i'm a woman it it, to it makes sense totally for me to dive into um the associated women when it comes to breaking the glass ceiling right because i am a woman okay all right like that's a good way to where, where i can start and then i look around myself what leaderships or leadership teams do I have that I work with? Who are the participants in my workshops? What else could I could I maybe dive into a little bit more? I would say start easy, definitely. I, I love listening to storytellers. And I find that, you know, even on, because I'm autistic, I digest information completely differently. Um, but I even love watching comedy sketches that you find on shows like Netflix on, um, because you actually get to hear stories and you get to actually experience how they feel and that's so much more than I can get from a book. And I can find, I find myself resonating with some of those lived experiences, shared experiences, which are quite, is it different perspective? 100%. And also somebody is mentioning this here, um, Nicolas Gazelle, I've seen your LinkedIn comment responding to this professional with elegance to a personal attack. Um, so basically there has been this person that comments uh, only recently that has been mentioning me as a person and also questioning me as a person and for me as a as like since i'm trans i even read this as very offensive not everybody might read this as offensive because they don't understand the trans experience to me this was very particularly offensive and nicolas is asking how should we react in real life um, in real life i just hope we do not get offended like this to be honest um, but it comes down to what you just said because what i try to do also then in my comments is recommend shows Yes. There's this Netflix series called Disclosure. If you want to understand why it's not cool to look at a trans person and look at them as if they were a clown, Disclosure explains this very well because like men with makeup have been the clowns for ages, which is not cool. Don't laugh at that anymore, right? This is like the new thinking. Listen to experiences, watch Netflix series, um, give them things to educate themselves and be patient, but also set boundaries. I'd say, Nicolas, set boundaries. That's what I try to do. Even in real life, be strict for a moment and be serious for them and be like this was not okay that was a little bit offensive to me but i'm going to explain to you why you know give them the benefit of the doubt that's my personal take on it yeah this, you were like, in real life is not always easy i was thinking just two weeks ago i was walking with my 
friend uh, and in end and then uh, someone sh shout on us and at the moment you also don't realize because you are it's completely out of your thinking and um, but I'm totally agree with you at the moment we didn't react we just ignore because unfortunately then you are used of that uh, and then you say okay well, why I have to spend my time um, but you are totally right uh, the best is really to say okay no and then explain and try to open a, a dialogue, but it's not always so easy. It's to breathe through it. Thank you, Ines, also for a reading recommendation. I found The Culture Map by Aaron Meyer a good read. I haven't read it. It's going to go on my list. Mm -hmm. But yeah, thank you for that, Ines. Um, now, wrapping it up a little bit. Uh, one last question from the audience, and then we'll be coming to a wrap-up question that I prepared. Um, what do we think about quotas? Women quota. That's I, I hate this word already. I, I'm biased here, but what do you how do you feel about it? It's a difficult one because in organisations you do need a quota, and you need to know binary genders for tax reasons, right? So sometimes you see organizations ask for quotas in that sense. Um, but in a fairness sense, it is important to have quotas, to have a benchmark of where you're at and where you need to get to, for people to really see you know, where there are problems in an organization, where there isn't equality, where there needs to be change. But I feel like some of the quotas I see are quite dated, or it's just male, female. I feel like we've moved past this, that now at the organization at the very top, they need to think very differently. I'm also a big fan of what I have to be uh, honest, also because uh, as I was saying at the beginning, yeah, then you have diversity, but if you don't have inclusion, yeah, you have a number. And yeah, can be a trend. This is the reason why I don't look so much at the diversity report, because they okay, it's just number nice, um, but then have to be all the rest um, behind that. And then quota is also a never end story. You can always have a new quota. So personally, I'm not a big fan of that. It was a hot topic in politics in Germany when, when we started it. So a very hot discussion. And I think also emotional discussion. And this is where it always gets problematic because uh, people feel attacked. I would say when it comes to women, men uh, quota, then men would feel attacked, definitely. Um, um, attack, not not doing the right things, etc. But I am definitely pro quotas because you we are talking about breaking the glass ceiling. There is a glass ceiling that's not easy to break. So we have to establish tools and start somewhere in order to break it because apparently we can break it ourselves, right? Um, minorities. Um, in all kinds of sense. So yes, I think I agree with you, Karim, what you said, like it's it's probably dated, yeah, you, you, we would have to update it and, and double check and, and ask again, are we still, is it still where we are at right now? Could we move on, et cetera? But I guess as, as a starting point, it's, it's, it's good to not only, again, awareness for it, but at the same time, supporting the companies to seriously move a step closer. And then of course, you have to follow up with everything that has to come with it, right? But you have to start somewhere. You can't you can't break it easily, and we can't do it ourselves. We tried. I, I couldn't. I, I, I was hitting the glass ceiling in my past, and that was it. So it's very interesting. I think when you're in a leadership position as well, and you, you feel like a number, and you're like, great, it helped you get closer to your quota. What does that mean for me as a woman? Are you going to create a different environment for me? Am I going to find some fun stuff in the bathrooms? Am I going to have, if I have a child, will I have, you know, will that be a fridge? Will you put my breastfeed and milk in there? Like, what will there be for me? What difference is it going to make to me? I can see the benefit for you, but what are you doing for me? Mm. Absolutely. Now, wrapping it up, because you were actually giving a good, like, Way, to the, way there, um, everybody just like one or two sentences, if you can. How do we break the glass ceiling? Maybe you want to wrap up your thoughts in one sentence again. You basically just answered it. Well, um, still, I want to go back to let's let's stop hiring people that are just like us. That for me was I, I tr kept reminding myself about it. And then it's all about different perspectives. 
Now she took mine. <laughs> Different perspectives, true. Yeah, yeah. but I, I said it before. Uh, I also think it's it's about bringing different perspectives also not to myself only but to others and let the people experience it so that's how i would do it 100 being more mindful that not everybody thinks like you and create an environment that make possible this perspective to become in that action thank you so much that was literally one sentence right that was amazing thank you so much so Wrapping up, we understood that this has many different layers. And we were, of course, mentioning this as diversity and leadership. But of course, we need representation everywhere. And we need role models. And we need people to like, you know, move everything a step forward. This could be you watching, perhaps. You know, maybe you feel motivated to tackle things tomorrow or maybe later today or whatever. No, today, just have dinner, but just tackle it tomorrow. Um, if you want to know anything more about, for instance, Idealo or sister company Aviv, there'll be a QR code on the screen later on with more information. There's even a newsletter if you want. Other than that, I just want to thank my amazing panelists. That was so nice. Dina, Natalie, Kieran, Fabio, thank you so much for having these very open conversations with me here today. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Also, thank you everyone behind the scenes. You know, this is a whole studio, everybody. So thank you so much, everybody here. Thank you so much for watching. Have a wonderful evening and see you next time.